We're in Genesis chapter 7, and we pick up where Pat left off with the building of the ark and sort of some of the logistical possibility or problems and, and the feasibility of whether or not, man, could you get all of the animals on there and, and what it was like. And so we're going to pick up um, uh, today in chapter 7, we sort of begin where there, Noah's told, you know, the, the ark is finished, and it's taken him a long time uh, to build this thing. And you just imagine what his faith journey would have been like up to this point as he's been building this um, ship, if you will. He's the father of the shipping industry, right? He built the first one, and, and uh, he's built it where there's no water. So it takes a lot of faith uh, to do something like that. And, and we come to the point in chapter 7, it's a little repetitive, and the Word often does that to reinforce um, some things for us. But It'll, it'll sound a little repetitive as I read through it, but just kind of picture and think about what it would have been like for Noah as he's told to enter the ark. And, um, you know, once, one thing that's interesting is that it had never rained. And that's kind of like, you, you, how did things, how do things, if it never rained, how, does, uh, how, do, how do the plants and everything, how, how's things nurtured? And uh, it, the Bible says that there would, you know, there would be a mist that would come up in the morning. And I kind of got to experience this on my elk hunt. We had some, um, we had some days that it was very cloudy, and you couldn't even see the mountains. And we were up, we'd get up in these higher elevations, and and um, I noticed that one day there was a couple of days that were really cloudy, you couldn't see the mountains, and then the third day we went up into the mountains, really high, and everything was wet. I mean, dripping wet. It was just water. There was water falling off of um, the the trees as we went up higher, and it was kind of fascinating because down lower, would, it was more like desert mountains in this part of Idaho. But it reminded me of how the Lord would have watered the earth with clouds like that and allowed them to descend, maybe, or, and the dew in the morning. I don't know exactly how it happened, but certainly this was a time where it had never rained before, and then you know that. That's something that's going to happen in chapter 7. It's going to begin to fall, and it's, I'm sure, concerning to people as they've never experienced something like that. Um, We pick up in verse 22. It says that Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Often we find that Noah is described as a righteous man, and and so we go, why was he righteous? And the reason he is referred to as a righteous person is the same reason that you and I can be referred to as righteous people. It's based on belief. He had faith in what God said. He believed God and he obeyed. And therefore, it was credited to him as righteousness, just like it was to Abraham and just like it is to us when we live on um, the other side. They lived on the uh, pre side of the cross. We live post cross. We look back to the cross. They looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. And so it is when we look in faith uh, at what God says and we believe him. And in that faith and in that belief, and we walk out our obedience, our faith leads us to obey, we're credited as righteousness, as, or as righteous. And it's not because of our obedience, it's because of our faith, our belief in what God said. And our obedience, if, if our faith is genuine, it will just bring about obedience. We will serve and we will do things as God leads us to do them, and we see needs um, within the kingdom, we will follow through and as good servants of his, do what is, it is he asks of us to do. But it says, then the Lord, uh, the Lord then said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, male and its mate, and one pair of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven pairs of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I've made. Now, there's something a little bit different in this accounting of the story than what Pat shared with you, and that is the number seven. Now we're asked, he's saying there's seven clean animals um, and uh, seven pairs and only one pair of unclean animals. What's going on there? Is there a contradiction? No, there's not. Um, One, these animals were going to be used to, um, first of all, sacrifice. And as they went into the ark, 
um, they went in as not eating meat. Okay, it wasn't a, they, the Lord didn't give them meat to eat uh, up until this point. Uh, they ate from plants. I suppose you could say they were vegetarians. But at the when they come out of the ark, as we'll see next week. Um, they come out of the ark and God gives them the animals. He puts the fear of man in the animals and he gives them even the animals to eat. And so it was to sustain them and still have a pair that could repopulate. So they would sacrifice and worship the Lord with some of these animals. And they would um, have, uh, if you will, uh, uh, something to start with in the beginning as God opened up the freedom to eat meet um, to Noah and, and all of us in Kansas City, we would say amen. amen. Those of you who are vegetarians, I don't know what you say, but I still say amen. <laughs> <laughs> so Noah, and this is a great thing about Noah, and it may, maybe you would underline this in your Bible, Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came on the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his wife's sons or in his son's wives, entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. And pairs of clean and unclean animals, of birds and of all the creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark as God had commanded Noah. And after the seven days, the flood waters came on the earth. And we see here that we have a creation story that we studied several weeks ago when God he, he creates all the animals, then he creates man, and he has Adam name the animals. And we know in that story, we, we, we see a lot of parallels here because God brings the animals to Adam. Well, now God is undoing creation, but he's going to preserve it in the midst uh, of undoing it. And he once again is participating in the work that he gives Noah to do as he brings the animals to Noah for their preservation, just as he brought them to Adam um, for their naming. And so uh, in the 600th year of Noah's uh, life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were open, and rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> now, that doesn't sound very long, but if you stop and think about it, if it rains for a week straight, like you start to think, man, when is the sun going to shine again? And this is 40 days and 40 nights. And simultaneously, um, this I don't know exactly how to explain what happened, um, but maybe you could go to, the th to Pat's thing tonight. I don't know and ask him. Uh, but there are springs, and we know that there are springs still that flow. But I kind of liken it to... You know, we know that there is fire and lava and stuff in the, the, the core of the earth, and it erupts in volcanic volcanoes, and, and we know that it can, like the fire comes out, and, and what it can do, I, I kind of envision that the springs of the deep, man, they were opened up and unlocked in a way that they never had been before. And we remember even in the creation story, that in the, before God created the dry land and had it appear, everything first was just water. And so there certainly was enough water to cover uh, the planet. And so here the, the springs, uh, uh, the rain begins to fall, the springs uh, break, uh, burst forth, and water just begins to inundate the planet. And on that very day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, together with his wife and the wives of the three sons, entered the ark, and they had... With them, every wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kinds, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, everything with wings, pairs of all creatures that have the breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing as God had commanded Noah, then the Lord shut him in. Now, I think there's a lot for us to kind of think about there. Like we, we went through COVID a, a few years ago and we had to shelter in place. We were shut in. Um, even if you wanted to try to go somewhere, there wasn't anything to do, man. Everything was closed, right? Well, he goes into this ark and God shuts him in. And I think it's fascinating that it says, 
that the Lord shut him in. Noah didn't close the door. God closed the door. And it took Noah 120 years to build this ark. Now, if you think about that, that's the number of days that God had said previously that would now be the, um, the days of man. They would be reduced. Prior to the flood, man lived a very long time. And part of that is for um, reproduction and, and multiplying and, and populating the earth. And part of it, I think, was due to the environment, how perfect and pristine it was that man could live that long. Uh, some of the uh, waters of the heavens that are mentioned, there are many that believe there was a canopy of, of ice, if you will, that um, surrounded the planet and caused a greenhouse effect. And during this time, the Lord allowed it to, to melt. And so maybe the beginning of global warming happened all the way back then, right? <laughs> and I don't think we'll fix that global warming. As a matter of fact, just as the Bible mentions this catastrophic event as a warning to mankind. It is a picture of the horrific event that will happen when God will once again destroy the planet, but he will use fire. And so um, and there may be some truth to this global warming that we can't escape that eventually prior to uh, the return of Christ or when the Christ returns, things will be remade and renewed. And so it is it's sort of a warning for all of that. And, and so mankind could live to be uh, very old prior to that. And, and, if, and, and again, you see the possibility, man, you know what can happen in, in a greenhouse. Like, like you could do amazing things with the plant um, uh, kingdom. And, and so if you had man living in that kind of environment, um, protected from the harmful rays of the sun, he's living a much healthier lifestyle. Not to mention the fact that, you know, the, the fall happens. And because of the fall, we see things progressively getting worse and disease increasing. And, and that's why we continue to struggle and fight against um, disease with our health. It's not so much that God is punishing us individually for sin that we've committed. A person may get cancer. No, it's just that disease is now a part of the fall. And some of us who are, have the strongest faith in the world um, can get sick of cancer and die, and it has nothing to do with a disobedience to God. It's just a result of the fall. There's, we're all going to die, and there's nothing we can do about it, and the Bible speaks very clearly of that, but prior to this, mankind lived a long time, and, and Noah was obedient and, and faithful for this 120 years while he was building uh, the ark, and he focused on what God asked him to do for 120 years. He was faithful for as long as as we will live. And I think there's some, a very important lesson there is that God expects us to be faithful. He expects us to listen to what he says and walk out our obedience. And, and that's, what it, that's how we get credited as righteous in his sight. And it's fascinating to see how many people don't want to listen to what he said, or they want to say that what he says in his word is, is, is um, you know, just man-made and, and a turn a deaf ear to it. And, and so what we as the followers of Christ, man, it's important for us to be faithful like Noah and, and take our lives and wrap them around the truth of God's word and believe it and walk it out in obedience because it is a testimony to the world around us uh, of, of who God is. And even if they reject it all of their lives, it may be that our lives are used to bear testimony at their judgment that they, they saw an example. They saw an example of what it means to follow Jesus. And so our faithfulness plays a, a huge role in the kingdom. He was faithful for a long time. He answered the call. And it's, it's a picture, uh, or if we picture what it was like for Noah while building I'm kind of amazed by it because being in the church, you know, you you come and you answer the call. I remember answering the call to this this fellowship when it was very small and I didn't know anyone and you come and and you work and and you you serve and you just believe God is going to do something. Well, and 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 here's here's what he does in Noah's case is like God tells him Noah, listen, I the wickedness of man is, is, is exceedingly great, and I've got to deal with it. And he says, um, I see you are listening to me. I see you're hearing my voice, 
and I want you to build an ark, and it's, it's going to protect you and your family and, and the world of creation. And he gives him the dimensions of it, overwhelming task, and he tells him to do it, and he just starts building for 120 years. Now just let that sink in for a moment. He doesn't see God moving. He asks him to preach the word that judgment was coming and salvation was available. He's calling on people to repent from their wickedness. No one is listening to him, and he's building an ark, and he's having to use some of the people that he's preaching to to build the ark. And so he's supervising this massive project, and there's no rain, and there's no water. And so what is he doing? It is a complete um, object lesson. And again, it is historically, like I believe it happened, but it also, like we see in the Bible, just the fascinating layers of types of, of, of reinforcing of the gospel. The, what does Paul say? We walk by faith and not by sight. That's what we do. We just keep believing God. And even as I have been involved in my, I've been involved in two churches. I have pastored two churches, the one back in Oklahoma and this one, and both are just the same. Just believe God. Just, just keep believing God and be faithful and let God do what he does and believe that he is, he's going to eventually bring to pass what he said that he was going to do um, in and through you and how he was going to use you and how he's going to spread the gospel for, through the foolishness of preaching and you just keep believing. And so some of you, are, you're probably like, um, you're a little frustrated, you're a little down, you're a little discouraged. You've been pounding um, the nails in the gopher wood, man, for a long time, and it's not raining. What do you do? Just keep hammering, man. Just keep hammering. Keep hammering, keep expecting. If God has called you into something and he, he's leading you in it and you, you're walking out your obedience, God is faithful and eventually um, things are going to shift. And so for 120 years, then he, he gets to the point where he's finished. <laughs> it's got to be awkward. He's like, you build this giant, like, ship that all it can do is float out in the middle of nowhere. You're like, well, we're done. You're like, and that's it. It's like you're just sitting there. God, at this point in the story, God's not said anything else to him but build the ark and I'm going to do something. But there had to have been some things along the way, and there always is. A friend of mine, he used to call it uh, breadcrumbs. The Lord will drop breadcrumbs along the way to keep you encouraged. And you'll see things. And certainly um, when I can look at church growth and, and being involved in ministry or any other um, type of thing that I felt like the Lord has led me into, I can always see along the way, um, even in those moments where I get a little frustrated, the Lord will drop a breadcrumb. A family will come. Um, a special gift will come in financially. Uh, for me, over the years, the church, the church kind of hit a point to where it hit about 80 or so, and then it just didn't grow. It didn't, and I wasn't doing anything different than I'd ever done, and I really wasn't doing anything different than I'm doing right now. Just preaching the word and believing God, and the church just wasn't growing. It just stopped growing, like numerically. But it just kept growing financially. <laughs> and it was amazing to watch because, and it was so encouraging to me to, um, that, that the Lord, that I would say, well, the, the Lord's people are get, becoming more and more faithful um, to what he's called us, us to do. And, and that carried uh, me, it just kept me encouraged to see that movement was happening. And, and then, you know, a, a family, a different families will come. Sometimes when a family, there'll be families that leave. The Lord sometimes calls key families. Um, they, they move, maybe or they're transferred by work. And, and man, it just hits you in the gut. And you're like, oh, geez, it felt like we were just getting some momentum. It's amazing to me that um, when somebody leaves, sometimes they leave for, for reasons that, um, you know, they like for work and just practical. Sometimes they re leave because they don't like the way you're doing things and they want to see them done differently. But yet you feel like God has called you to do things a certain way. And, and so they leave and, and boy, it just like it hurts. And you're like, man, I, what are we going to do? I, I can tell you, like I've been in, I've been ministering as a pastor for 30 years. And I'm going to tell you, without exception, every time that happens, every time a key family leaves, 
It's like God replaces them with five more families. It's amazing. And, and those are breadcrumbs. And I, I think that that's probably something that was happening along the way for Noah. And it's something that you should look at. And, and so we, we are at the point in the story where God is beginning to move. But I believe as, as Noah was getting to the point of completion, I believe animals started showing up. Like, wh- what is that? Maybe an ostrich shows up and Shem is like, him. What the heck is that, man? Right? Never seen one of those. Where did that thing come from? And and just different, and, and they're gathering around, and man, you, boy, they probably started building a little faster when that happened, right? We got motivated, man. We're going to work a little harder and, and implement our training and ask the people to watch it online and serve in the kids' ministry, right? Yeah. Hey, man, man. <laughs> Uh, and so they were fired up because they saw the hand of the Lord moving, man. And, and, and I'm sure that God was doing different things along the way like that. Even though there were no one, other people starting to believe, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they were probably paying the people to work on the ark. They didn't do it by themselves. And, and so they're, 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 they're at this particular point. And then God tells Noah to take his family and enter the ark. Now, I love this because God doesn't say, get all the animals organized and go in and and lead them in the ark. He says, take your family and you go into the ark in seven days, it's all going to start. And so for seven days, they're sitting in the ark. All the animals that I'm sure some of them had gathered around. We say, well, how do the animals know to do this? This is, I think this is really cool too, if you stop to think about, um, there's uh, tsunamis or I think tidal waves, different things that have happened in the world. And they, I remember watching and reading about or seeing about uh, one of those happening and, and all the animals, bef- the people didn't even know it was happening, but animals started moving to high ground before. How do they do that? I, I don't know. God's wired them that way, I suppose. And so God, certainly if he created them, he can um, cause them miraculously to do what he wants. And so they're out there and, and, and Noah and, and his family goes into the ark and they're sitting in there. I, I'm sure it's not a, a well-lit place. It's got some windows up at the top. It doesn't have any windows in the side. It's, they didn't have like all these portholes, right? Like they didn't have balconies on the ark. This thing was made to protect them from dying. And so it was just made to float, and that's it. And, and uh, we see later um, that, that they even took the covering off. It took a long time before they took the covering off so that they really could get a glimpse of the sky. They had some small windows that they let the birds out of, but that's next week. Don't want to get too ahead of myself. Um, but it, it, So they're sitting in there in a dimly lit place, um, all these stalls that they've created and all the food that they've stored inside the ark, and they're just waiting and it's an incredible week as they sit and wait and the animals begin to enter. <laughs> and they just start kind of coming into the ark. And I really believe that they went exactly where they were supposed to go. I don't believe it was, it was crazy and chaotic. I believe it was miraculous. I believe that everything did what it was supposed to do. And it was an encouragement to Noah as he had been preaching and building for 120 years. And his sons had been with him and, and um, uh, his wife and, and, and his kids were part of it. Man, and they're, they're serving and they're building and they're listening and believing God. And, and now they're seeing the miracles start to come to fruition as the animals start entering the yard. And I can't imagine the joy he experienced as he witnessed the miracle. <laughs> I, actually, I can in, imagine it a little bit. Um, I, I'm at a, such a sweet place in my life. I, I've always possessed the joy of the Lord, but it, it seems like it has a depth and, um, to it now in my life that, that it's never had uh, and, and a contentment. Walking around the mountains uh, as I was on this trip, um, I was so filled with joy when I left. It wasn't going to matter if I harvested an elk or not. It just wasn't going to matter. Uh, you couldn't make me any more joyful than I already am. I'm just filled with joy, and part of that joy comes from um, how I see the Lord moving in the ministry, and how I see Him moving in my heart and moving in my family's life and, and, and the lives of my kids. And, and as I see the Lord moving in you guys, and the Lord continues to bring new people all the time. There are new people here today that I've never seen before. 
And, and I think that's how Noah felt, man. He, he's seeing animals that he'd never seen before, and they're just coming on the ark, just like God said. And as I see new families come into the, the church, and we're a church that, man, we don't, we don't compromise on the word of God. We preach it in all of its authority. We don't try to say, oh, well, that meant something for a different time. We believe it means exactly what it meant when God wrote it and said it, and we just, like, live by it, man. And, and, and I, I'm encouraged and I'm just filled with joy the more that I see uh, people like Gianna and her testimony and, and saying, man, I'm hearing the Lord and, and I'm asking myself, why shouldn't I get baptized? The Lord said that I should get baptized. She's hearing from the Lord and she's walking out her obedience and it's credited to her as, as righteousness. And that brings me joy. It brings me joy when I, when I see a family that's about to just totally implode and all of a sudden, man, a, a resurrection miracle happens in their marriage and things are put back together and they begin to talk about how God's going to use them to help other couples in the same situation. And when I see a, a, a man who admits that he's a sinner and he's never received Christ as his savior and he repents of his sins and he is saved by the grace of God, man, there's joy in that. And those are the things that mean the most. And, and so I, 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 I can't imagine somewhat of what it would have felt like for, for Noah as we're actually kind of living the same thing if you stop and think about it um, in our day and age. And, and the last animal enters and the week ends. And I don't think that it took seven days for all of them to get on. Matter of fact, I think they probably got on pretty quick. And the door is just open. And they're just looking at it. And they just look at it day after day after day. But on day seven, the Lord closes it. And I, I, I envision probably Noah is like, I wonder if Joe's going to come. I really liked working with that guy. He was good at construction. I enjoyed his family, his kids. I wonder if he's going to come. And they're just looking at it and wondering, when are the people going to come? As the beast of the field knew to come, and the people would not come because of their hardness of heart. And God shuts them in, and the rain starts to fall. And they hear it. They can't see it. They can just hear it. I don't think they could see out of this ark. If they could see anything, it was only up and, and maybe only a little bit because of the way they had to secure it. And, and so they hear it raining. They don't even know what's going on out there. And it rained, and it rained hard. And the outsiders, some went high, I'm sure. Some looked for ways to save themselves as they started to ascend up on high ground as probably when it first started raining, they probably like, this is cool, man. How refreshing this feels on my body. And they were probably capturing some of it as they drank it and thought there's water everywhere, but it just kept raining. And ultimately, they started to get concerned as the puddles turned into ponds and the ponds started to appear as lakes. And they're like, we can't stay here. And they started moving to high ground, looking for a way to save themselves, just like we see people doing in our day and age. Some went high and others came to the ark. No doubt they were shouting, let us in, but the door was shut and Noah didn't shut it. It was God who shut the door. And in time, the ark lifted and it started to float. And the the, the word goes on to tell us that it floated a high above even the mountains. I, I think it's like some 23 feet. And that was necessary because this thing couldn't be steered. Like it was just a floater, man. It was just like a giant, <laughs> maybe like one of them giant swans you see people in at the lake. It just moves around wherever it goes, right? <laughs> and they're just in it, man. And, and it had to be able to float over rocks and stuff. And so God took care of that. But I imagine people hanging on the outside of it that didn't go to high ground. And the only thing like the picture that I think I've ever seen that would be similar to it is when we were evacuating people out of Afghanistan and people were flooding to that cargo plane and they were standing on it and the thing took off. And I, I, I was in disbelief as I watched someone fall from the sky to their death. And that's sort of what was happening. But God had shut the door. No one would come in. No one could come in at that point. So what do we learn from this? 
How does it apply to us? For God has said he will never flood the earth again, but he's also said he will destroy it. And so it is a picture of what we're headed toward climactically um, at the end of time where where we're moving toward every generation is responsible for carrying the good news of the gospel and telling people about the impending judgment that will fall on the world. And the first thing that we learned is the saved are secure. Those who are in the ark, when you listen and believe God, you are a shut-in. And God is the one who shuts you in. You can't shut yourself in. Hell may threaten you, but it cannot touch you when God saves you. And that's what we deal with. We deal with the sound of the rain. We deal with the uncertainty of where the currents may take us. But all along, we know that God has promised that he will care for us and not even a sparrow has fallen to the ground without God's notice. And how much more important are we to him as we listen and we obey and we heed his voice? He will care for us. This is why he, when they ask, the disciples asked Jesus to teach us to pray. He said, when you pray, pray like this. My Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give me this day my daily bread um, that I might be able. I think what he's saying is provide for me. Ask God to provide for you so that you may be able to turn your attention to the things of the kingdom. And God will do it. And this is what they did. They were in the ark believing and they were secure And there may be things on the outside that intimidate us from time to time. There may be health reports. There may be things that we get anxious about, about our kids. But we have to be reminded we walk by faith and not by sight. And we are secure in the gospel when we believe what God said. And we have to walk that out, man. No matter what you face, no matter what news hits you this week, no matter how discouraged hell may try to get you, sometimes you just have to push pause on your life and go, wait a minute. I'm a shut-in. I'm inside the ark, and I don't need to fear anything. I don't need to fear anything that might happen to the economy. I don't need to fear anything that might happen um, by, by, by the government. I am a shut-in, and I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. I am a citizen of his kingdom before I am anything else. And it's not America that's going to protect me. It is Jesus. Jesus is the one who shut the door on the ark. And Jesus is the one who shut the door on my life, and he saved me. And I just walk that out, man. I just believe in Jesus. How do I know I'm, I'm secure in the Lord? Do I believe in Jesus, man? Not do I believe I did a good job on last week's sermon or did I give enough or did I help enough people? Did I believe in Jesus and I counted him as my righteousness and I seized a hold of that? That's the only thing that matters. And then my obedience will flow out of that. But my, 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 um, my God's perception of me as a righteous person has nothing to do with my performance in the kingdom. As a matter of fact, if you're not careful, you can turn that into self-righteousness and you will be just like one of those people who's ascending to high ground, but you're not inside the ark. Or maybe you're hanging on to the ark, but you're not in it. You may be close to it, but you haven't received the righteousness of Christ because you're trying to work for your righteousness. You can't work for righteousness. It is something that only God can give, and the only way that he will give it is if you believe that he who shut the door is also the door. That's it. And all you can do is believe and hold on to that. And so the saved are secure as long as we believe and hold on to the truth of the gospel. Grace is available is the second takeaway. The door was open and even the beasts knew they needed to come in. And grace was available for all those who wanted to come in. For 120 years, God had set the years that he had been building this ark and saying, hey, something is coming, something is coming. Noah had been preaching the word. It had been going forth to the known world as he is um, telling why he is preaching or why he is building the ark. and, And the door remains open even another seven days after Noah enters the ark and the animals enter the ark and something miraculous is happening. You see, the miracles increased as it got time closer for judgment to fall, just like it did with the time of Jesus. The miracles increased as Jesus was performing the miracles and then the cross happens and opens the door for the way of salvation. 
And that's what will happen at the second coming of Christ. Miracles will increase just like the animals started to come and the ark was finished and the rain started to fall. All of this miraculous stuff starts happening. But what happens to the heart of man? If they've never listened to the word of God, they just find an excuse to continue to reject. That's why it's so important for us to be about the business of doing what Jesus called us to do, to go therefore and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And yet we get so caught up in the materialism and making money and doing our work that we think we don't have time to be engaged in the most important thing that you will ever be engaged in, and that's making a disciple. You look at your life and you go, how much time did I spend last week making disciples and how much time did I spend last week making me? It started like, whoa, it's going to be convicting, right? And so like we, we need to look and go, man, I need some urgency around this because grace is available right now. It is available and I've been a recipient of the grace because I'm inside the ark of God's um, covenant man with me that I have entered a relationship and there are many who are on the outside and they need to know the good news Grace is available today for the weary. Grace is available for the broken. Grace is available for the lost. Grace is available for the wicked man. It's available. And the third takeaway is the end of grace is coming. The end of grace is coming. God will once again close the door of grace. And the same um, God, which is Jesus, who closed the door of the ark, will close the door of grace in our age. And we're called to believe and share the good news that grace is available. The time is approaching when grace will be no more. And we don't even know what that's like. Just like the people didn't know what it was like to receive rain, we don't know what it's like. No one, even the wicked, doesn't know what it's like for grace to be no more. It rains on the just and the unjust farm. Even the wicked man benefits from the grace of God as he replenishes the earth with water. As uh, we walk through and receive like um, just our health, that is the grace of God. Like the grace of God is available to all humans, even those who have completely rejected God, they are touched by the grace of God. It is those who though understand that God's grace has been been made available through the cross of Christ that we are recipients of salvific grace, that grace that would spare us from the judgment. You see, we are not saved from our sins. We are saved from the judgment of God, and our sins are forgiven so that we could be shut in when judgment falls. It doesn't harm us because God doesn't see us as sinners. He sees us as righteous. Why? Because we believe. The end of grace is coming. The time is approaching when grace will be no more. Jesus said it best when John the Revelator recorded in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the keys of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. He shut the door of the ark, and he'll shut the age of grace as well. Noah believed what God said and he obeyed, and we are called to do the same. Jesus' story uh, about his coming is talked about in Matthew chapter 25 of the parable of the ten virgins. Five of them are wise, five of them are foolish. The bridegroom was coming, and he was going to select a bride. And so they all went and waited, and as they waited, they had their lamps so they could turn their lamps on so that the bridegroom could see them and make his choice of who he wanted. And when they are there waiting, they fall asleep. And five of the wise ones took oil with them in case they ran out. Their lamps ran out. They could replenish them. The foolish ones didn't. The foolish ones weren't prepared. And so the call goes out. The bridegroom is coming. The bridegroom is coming. And they all wake up, man. They look at their lamps. And these uh, five wise ones go, whoa, my lamp is about out. They fill that thing up, man. And the five foolish ones go, ah, my lamp is out. Let me have some of your oil. Not going to do it, man. It's for my lamp. You'll have to go to the market. And they go to the market and they run off to the market. And when they get back, we pick up in this story, and this is Jesus talking, but while they were on their way in Matthew 25, 10, while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. And the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day 
or the hour. What did Jesus say? I'm the door. I'm the gate. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I am life. And that brings us to the big idea of today's message. You need to come in to be shut in. (laughs) Right? You need to come in to be shut in. That's all you can do is believe and come in. And, and that's the only way you can come in. Like the animals came in, they, they believed what God said, and they showed up and they went in. Noah believed what God said, and he went in, and he, he got shut in because he showed up and he believed God. This is a picture of the church. It's a picture of the church when Jesus would come and he would make a way, and he would be the gate, he would be the door, but he is also the one who will close the door. And so as we look at this and begin to think about the picture of the church, many worked on the ark, but they weren't in the ark. And there'll be many people who work on the church, but they're not actually in the church. And when I say the church, I mean the church invisible, the church universal. I don't mean OPCC. Everybody who belongs to OPCC doesn't belong to the church. So, well, what's the difference? Some people are shut in and some people haven't. Some people really believe God, and some people are just coming along for the ride, man. They're just coming along because they like it. They come along because of the people, maybe. But they've never come to a place where they recognize, I am a sinner. I am offensive to God. There's no goodness in me when I look deep down inside and confess their sin and need for a Savior, humble themselves before Christ, and recognize, Jesus, you are the door. Jesus, you are the gate. Jesus, you are life. I repent of my sin. I come into you, Lord. Please come into me. And when we believe in Jesus, we come in and he shuts us in. And when the judgment falls, we need not worry. That's why we're filled with joy. Because we know we don't deserve to be a shut-in, but we are shut-ins. And we know the only reason we're shut-ins is because of what Jesus did. And so for the joy of the Lord, man, we go about doing our business and serving in the kingdom and living life and not like the rest of the world. Even when we lose family members, the word says we don't grieve like the rest of the world who has no hope. Why? Because we're shut in. We're shut in, man. And so it's good to be shut in, but you got to come in in order to be shut in. If you're shut in, here's the good news. The more it rains, the higher you get to heaven. The closer you get to Jesus. The more it rains down judgment, the closer you get to Christ. That's what happens for the shut-in. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. We're going to take communion this morning. Only you and Jesus know if you're shut-in. Only you and Jesus know if you have come to him and you're shut in and if you've never come to him listen it's simple but it is deep and profound it's simple to understand and I think that's one of the reasons it's hard for men to do because they want something harder to do (coughs) but the simpleness of the gospel is you believe it you believe it and receive it and the depth And how profound it is, is that it transforms you into a new creature when the Lord shuts you in with his salvation. And so I can't tell you exactly what that's supposed to look like in your life, but you know if the Lord is calling you to come in today. And before we partake of communion and and before you drink of that juice and eat that bread, it's not going to do anything but be offensive to the Lord if you are not a shut-in. If you've never been shut in, like you shouldn't even partake of communion. You say, why? Because you're doing it in an unworthy manner. You haven't received Christ. You're still one who's trying to climb up the mountain or you're working on the ark and you're not in the ark. And so today should be a day of salvation where you walk away rejoicing if that's never happened in your life and you simply in that moment in time and this moment in time that you're sitting in that chair, you pray and you confess to Jesus your brokenness, your helplessness, and your need of him as a savior. And that's what it means to be saved. And so I'd encourage you to do that and then partake of communion if you've never done that. 
And so as I pray and lead us in this prayer, I want to encourage you to have a personal time with the Lord, even those of you who are already inside the ark, so to speak, and then participate in communion as the Lord leads you. Heavenly Father, we love you today. We thank you for the story of Noah and the building of the ark. (laughs) Lord, forgive us when we're so prone to look at how harsh it seems. We will criticize it sometimes and say, God, you look harsh there, but remind us, Jesus, that that is you. And you're not harsh there. You're gracious. And what we need to see is the hardness of man's heart, our obstinance as humans, and your graciousness to even offer salvation. And through that, Lord, even give us an opportunity to experience a relationship with you. And we pray, Lord, that those of us who know you, we would have an urgency about our lives as we picture the coming judgment in the future. And knowing that the gospel is available and that we are not only to be recipients of it, but we're to be sharers of it and sharing the good news. And I pray that you'd give us favor in that and you would gather people to this body of believers much like you gathered the animals into the ark. And they would come. Those who are hungry would come. Those who are searching for you, Lord, they would come. We wouldn't have to go out and get them, Lord. We just take care of them when they get here, Lord. And let us be a testimony to everything that is happening in our community and the world around us, that the gospel is relevant and that you're still moving and miracles are still happening as people come to the altar of salvation and they are shut in by you, Lord. And joy hits their hearts that changes them into new creatures. We know that, Lord, we can't do that in our power But we know that is your will, and so we pray for it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.